Hello, welcome to the New Magnetism Simplified Model of Permanent Magnets. Um, in this video, we're going to show that you can actually treat a magnet as a simple loop of current. Uh, we're going to show you how to properly use the MagnaView film, and we're going to also demonstrate the magnet table, which allows you to compute the current of a magnet. Okay, we've done these separately in separate videos. I'm putting this all together because we have a lot of interesting things coming up in the near future. The first of which is the Paradox 3 experiment, which is going to make heavy use of this model. And it behooves everybody to get familiar with this model so they understand the importance of the Paradox 3 experiment as it's released. And number two, we've had questions on both the blog site and the YouTube site, people questioning, you know, well, how do you compute the current of the loop? Or how, how does a, a 15 Gauss magnet, da 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 And I'm going to show you that those, that there are other ways of, quantifying magnets that are quite useless even though they're in common use. All right, so let's begin. Uh, one, this paper here called New Magnetism, this has the complete description of the simplified model in it. And I'm going to show you how you can get to this paper. This paper is for free. And all you have to do is go to distinti.com. Oh, that was the wrong one. Hold on. That's the one I'm looking for. And go to distinti.com website and scroll down till you see new electromagnetism. And you can either click on the symbol or click on the see more. Okay, and then you can read through the little bit of the history. And then you go down here, down to the bottom. And here is the paper. Click the see more and that'll open up the paper new magnetism. There's new electromagnetism and the foundation series videos here. There's new induction applications and there's my graduate thesis paper. Okay, so this is all the, the foundational work for new electromagnetism. Most of this is going to be uh, superseded by new electromagnetism V5, which is coming in the next month. Exactly when, I don't know. It's got, I've got so much work to do before I get there, and this is a one-man show. I've got to do the website. I've got to do everything. And if it weren't for the help from my Patreon folks giving me some supplemental funding to get some of this other work taken, you know, doing done somewhere else, I'd be a lot farther behind than I am right now. So if you want to help out this project, you can go to the Patreon site, which is newelectromagnetism.com, and help, you know, $5 a month and help me out a lot. If we can get like a thousand people to do that, that would be great. But in any event, that's where you find this paper. And chapter eight is a simplified model of permanent magnets. Now, I'm not the person who really invented this. I'm just the person who made it practical. See, if you will look at uh, Maxwell's A Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, Volume 2, Articles 423 to 492, he describes the interaction of magnetic shells, essentially flat magnets, as being analogous to current carrying loops. So I'll say that again. Magnets are analogous to current carrying loops. So he was the first guy to describe this. Okay, and this shouldn't be a shocker to people who work in electromagnetism because the Biot Savart model. Okay, let me get rid of these other guys so I can see what I'm looking at. Basically describes in their model that magnetic field is generated by the closed integral around a current carrying loop. Essentially, that's what that means. So, I, so a magnetic field can be described as a, a line integral around a closed current loop. Now, in new electromagnetism, this model is only valid for closed loop as this is, limit, is, is constrained here by that little c means a closed circular loop because this model here that uses the cross product is not a complete model of magnetism, and you'll see that coming forward in the V5 models. Or if you want to look in the new magnetism paper, uh, we have the original version of new magnetism, which is a spherical field model, where this little cross product implies that a magnetic field is a transverse field model. But it's okay because in a closed loop, only the transverse components are used. And so this model is valid for closed loops. And where, where do you say, well, where do you have a loop that isn't closed? Well, look at a charge flying in free space by itself or look at a dipole antenna. Those would be the cases where these models do not apply. Okay, but let me put that aside and get back to the paper. 
And so if you want to go down, there's a cute little picture here. This is basically, and I'm going to unblow it up. I'm going to go back a little bit here. This is basically a magnetic material. And you can see there's little loops here. These, these are the electrons in the shell of a particular, you know, ferrite atom or a neodymium magnet atom, whatever, whatever, whatever the magnetic material is. And a magnetized material has all these loops spinning in the same direction. Okay, now, a little back up here. In a real magnetic material, it's not all of them, because if it were all of the loops are in the same direction, you would have a magnetic field that would be so strong it would disintegrate matter. Okay, so in reality, this is like maybe every tenth or every hundredth molecule. I don't didn't do the exact equation. It's not every one. But we're showing you this because it's easy to demonstrate this way. So if you have all these atoms where their loops are going in the same direction, you notice that right here and right here and wherever these loops come together, there's equal and opposite currents. These equal and opposite currents at a very, very far distance from this, which is anything you're going to do on a bench top, okay, maybe at the atomic level, the separation between these is a noticeable magnetic field. But at the benchtop level, where most of the experiments we're going to be doing, these are so close together that they essentially cancel. And then so what you can do then is basically cancel them out so that the only current you have left are the currents around the outside of the magnet. Okay, now if you have a hole in the magnet, well, that uncovers the little orbitals in the other direction. So you actually have a counter-rotating loop when you have a hole in a magnet. And we can show that here is a magnet with the magnet view film over and at the edges you see the current. That's what this shows. This shows the edge current. And we have a little magnet, a little tiny magnet with a little south marker on it. And you'll find that this magnet will be south on the inside and north on the outside. No, I take that back. It's going to show south on the inside and south on the outside. Uh, because the currents on the opposite sides of these magnets go in opposite directions. So these currents actually rotate in opposite directions to show you the counter-rotating edge currents. i got to double check. I'm pretty sure it's going to be south on the outside because the current on this side of this little magnet goes this way and it goes the opposite way on this side. So when you bring this to the outside, it'll still show south on the outside because the current in this little magnet is going around the outside because it's a disk magnet. So what we do, we call the, a, a magnet without a hole in it, we call it a disc magnet, and a magnet with a hole in it, we call it a ring magnet. That's the nomenclature. And we can show you this current cancellation because if we take four magnets, two north side up, uh, sorry, two south side up, one north side up, and you can see the direction of the edge currents here, well, right in this seam between these two magnets, the edge currents are going in opposite directions. So the magnet view film shows nothing. Whereas over here, these two edge currents are going in the same direction, and the magnet view film shows something. But you'll notice it doesn't really show anything brighter than this edge here. You would think this would be twice the brightness. Well, that's one of the problems in the magnet view film, is it saturates pretty early. It, gets, it starts showing something, and then no matter how bright or how intense a magnetic field, it doesn't get any brighter. So the way we can show you that this is twice the power as this is by using a steel ball. And if we put a steel ball on this magnet, it's going to be drawn to this intersection between these magnets because that's where the current is the strongest. And that is the area of the most attraction, and that's where the steel ball is going to go. And you can try this for yourself. These, actually, these magnets are actually hot melt glued to this piece of wood because otherwise these two would fly apart over here. Okay, now if we put the magnet view film along the side of the magnet, we see that the current ring is actually along the center of the magnet. If we use one of these big bar, well, I call it a rectangular magnet, not a bar magnet, and we can see that the current ring goes around the center. And the little disc magnet is attracted right to that little center current, and that's where the current is in the magnet. And if you model the current as halfway across the center of the magnet, You'll get very good results if you use a field meter and be able to compute the field from a rectangular magnet to a distance, and you'll be able to compute the fields very accurately, and we're going to demonstrate that. Now, the reason why the currents are, are squashed around the center is because at the center, because light currents attract, these edges all scrunch together, and so at the, at the center 
is where you're going to see the brightest spot because these currents attract. In fact, we can show that because if you put two bar magnets together, you'll see that those center edge currents actually attract each other. They get distorted. And if you put these magnets in repulsion, you'll see that the edge currents are actually pushed farther away from where they would be along the center. This is the center line right here. And this is the center line here. But you can see that these, because these magnets are in repulsion, these edge currents are repelling and they're actually forced along the side away from each other. Okay, and so this is the nature of these, this film. This film shows you kind of where the edge currents are. And a lot of other people say, well, like, you know, Ken Wheeler says, that, well, the Magna View film shows you where the, uh, the uh, inertial plane is, and I have no idea why, how that's even useful. There's other magnet manufacturers out there that tell you the Magna film shows you where the north and south cross over. Well, uh, the north and south cross over where the current ring is. So why use that terminology? I don't know. Okay, so the other thing you have to be careful about is not all magnets have their currents around the edges. We have interesting magnets where the domains are actually printed through the body of the magnet. And here you have currents going in opposite directions, zigzagging, if you will, along the body of the magnet. So you got to be careful. That's why the MagnaView film is important because it shows you where the currents run. So, you know, you wouldn't want to model this as a disk magnet. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know what, I, we don't have a name for this. Uh, zigzag magnet or multi-domain magnet, whatever you want to call it, but this this would not be a disk magnet according to the ethereal mechanics new electromagnetism definition because the currents don't actually run coherently only around the outside. That's the definition. All right, now if I'm not going to go over the rest of this, these are show you that the uh, the, the edge currents are the highest point of attraction and repulsion, and these little experiments you can you know go get this. Uh, thing yourself and you can do these experiments yourself. Um, this has lots of other good information in it This and it's free. Just go to my website, download it. Uh, this is all on a file at the Library of Congress. So this has all been properly copyrighted. And uh, that's it for now. Now most of this stuff is going to be mostly accepted into the newer version Electromagnetism V5 because most of this stuff in here is still good. Small parts of it have been uh, over superseded and they're going to be dropped. I'm not sure which ones yet, uh, but most of the stuff in here is still considered valid in terms of new electromagnetism V5. There is going to be updates as far as, you know, the application of transvariance to all of this because new magnetism or magnetism is where transvariance uh, does most of its work. So this is going to be some additional material to this that isn't here. Okay, next we're going to go to the magnet table to show you how we actually compute a magnet as a current ring. Okay, what you're looking at is the magnet table. What the magnet table is, is a very sensitive magnetic field sensor on a flat plane made up of a board. And this board is suspended on top of the table I'm working on by a cardboard box. And the purpose of the cardboard box is to separate the magnet table from the table, which has uh, steel reinforcement uh, running along the length of the table, and it could disturb the magnetic field. Here is the place you put the magnet you're trying to measure, and you can move it with this little uh, square to the location you'd like to measure it at. Okay, so, like, you know, for example, when we measure, we're going to be measuring where the left edge of the magnet is at. Uh, the little magnetic sensor is driven by an Arduino board, which runs into a PC, where we have C-sharp software that actually, you can see on the bottom there, there's kind of a mock-up of the table, and it shows you the location of the magnet and the location of the magnetic field sensor along the bar. And we're doing everything in uh, meters here as far as length, but the interesting thing about these magnets are that most of them are specified in English units and so the input fields here I have specified that you can switch between English and metric units. Okay so the first thing you do oh, before we measure the magnet we're going to take the magnet away because we're going to show you how to calibrate the table. Now the reason why I'm showing you all this is because I tend, tend to make this table available for everybody to see but right now I'm going to show you right now the software is a little bit kludgy 
and requires you to do some things. So right now there is no magnet on the magnet table. I'm going to return the camera to the tripod so that I can make my hands free. So what's on the top here? This is the actual tool that, you, that interfaces to the uh, little sensor. And this, is, this is, can be used regardless of which tool. This, is the, this tool then is linked into this tool to actually use this guy to take the measurements which this guy then uses. This is the actual magnet table software. The first thing you do when you set up the board is you've got to do a calibration. You've got to first read the straps. This, uh, explain what that is later. And it's going to read all the straps and the different colors. And when it's done, okay, when it's done, then you're going to analyze the data. And this, what this does is this puts the calibration values into the, into the, to the software and into the sensor, I think, one or the other. Okay, once you've zeroed the table with uh, no magnet in, in sight, you take out, um, let me zoom back out. I found the best way to measure the magnets is to use a pair of carbon fiber calibers, calipers. And now let me zero this. So this magnet is 0.75 inches. I don't know if you can see that in the camera. The lights are so bad in here. It's 0.75 inches in width. It's one inch in length. 0.18 inches in height. And the hole is 0.19 inches. So we're going to enter that. And what you can do with the tool Okay, so we're going to say it's rectangular. We're putting the, the, the munis in in inches. The width was 0.75. The length was 1 inch. Height, uh, I think that was 0.18, and the whole diameter was 0.19. Okay, now we're going to switch back to centimeter because our distance measurements are going to be in, in centimeters. That'll just translate all these measurements. Now, one of the things is I only put this to two decimal places. I should have put it uh, to more decimal places because it actually does affect it a little bit. All right, and then what we're going to do, we're first going to put the magnet, we're going to put the magnet south side up. I'm going to show you that now. We put it south side up. We're going to move it all to 10, let's say. And so we put the left edge of the magnet at 10. That's how the, this system works. doesn't matter if it's a round magnet. doesn't matter if it's a square magnet, whatever. We just go by the left side. That's the easiest way to do it than trying to say, well, where the center of the magnet is. Because we have the dimensions of the magnet, we can compute where the center is from knowing where the left side is. Okay, so then over here, we're going to put left edge is at 10 centimeters. Okay, and then we're going to tell it. Oh, I forgot to do something first. Let me take the magnet off. Okay, I forgot to tear this. I'm going to tear this now, which gets rid of the static magnetic field. And I'm going to put the magnet back at 10 centimeters. And I'm going to tell the table to take a measurement. Okay, and, the ma and, the, and it's saying that the current of the magnet, I don't know if you can see that, is 552 amps. Okay, the reason why it's negative is because the magnet, eh, where's the magnet? The magnet is south side up. So we're going to put the magnet north side up. Oh, it wasn't exactly at 10. It moved. Oh, it's going to be different. So I'm, but I'm going to put the north side up. I moved it again. 
Okay, and then we're gonna go back to the screen here. I hate this. I wish we had a camera, two cameras. Okay, and I'm gonna tell it to measure it again. And the current is around 600 amps, which is correct. That's what we had before. So I'm gonna flip it over again, just so you can show we get minus about 600 as well. 587, so we're off by a little bit, that's fine. I'm not gonna quabble over 10 amps on a 600 amp magnet. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the magnet source north side up again, I'm gonna move it to 15 centimeters. But I have to tell it now the left edge is now at 15 centimeters. And then I have to tell it to take a measurement and it should still 600 amps. That's how good the model is. Plus or minus three amps is not a big deal. Um, and you'll notice that the automatic gain is on and the gain is set to zero. I don't know if you can see that up there. See it says uh, in the green field, it says nominal gain equals zero. Okay, the reason for that is this magnet is kind of weak and so the gain is like all, I believe gain zero is gain all the way up. So we're starting to get to the point where uh, this magnet is getting to be too far away that it's very difficult to get a solid reading of it from the thing. So but I'm going to move it one more bit away to show you how good the model is. Okay, I'm going to set the left edge to, oh, I don't know, 20. Now the left edge is at 20 centimeters. Now we're going to set the left edge to 20 centimeters. And we're going to tell it to measure. And 598. Okay, that's how good the model is. That's, that shows that you can basically, because all this software is doing is treating that little magnet as a current, a rectangular current ring with a little counter-rotating current ring for the hole. And it's computing what, if I had a counter-rotating, if I had a rectangular ring at that distance from the center, okay, and I'm reading that particular flux from the sensor, how much current do I, would I need in that little thing in order to give me that kind of reading at the sensor. So that's what it's doing. And the fact that it's showing you virtually 600 amps no matter where we move it, shows you how good the model is, okay? Uh, because it's, it's, it's tracking very well. And that's the reason why I made this table, so I could check this phenomena at different distances to show that you know, by modeling a magnet this way, you can get very good answers and very good answers of what the current in the, in the, in the magnet is. Uh, this completes the demonstration of the magnet table operation. Uh, as you've probably realized from the video, the table software is not very user friendly yet. Um, I need to make it more automatic in its ability to calibrate and check itself. Uh, if you know what you're doing when you use this, you can get very good measurements and very good uh, quantification of the amperage of a magnet. And like I've said, treating magnets as current rings or, you know, as current loops is the best way to quantifying a magnet. Because you can, from that, knowing where the current rings are, how, what their geometry is, and knowing what the current is, you can compute the magnetic field of that magnet at very precisely at any point in space around the magnet. 